Welcome everyone to the Net Inclusion webinar series. Today we're going to talk about local government and state digital inclusion funding offices, coordination and policy. I'm Angela Seifer. I'm the executive director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. This is our Net Inclusion webinar series that replaces our full Net Inclusion in-person conference and we'll be getting started shortly. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Net Inclusion webinar series and we will be getting started shortly. Welcome, this is the Net Inclusion webinar series. We're gonna get started now. I just hit the record button. I'm Angela Seifer, I'm the Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and I am thrilled that you all are here with us today. This is gonna be an amazing panel. We're gonna talk about local government, state government, the digital inclusion work they're doing and the big question, where's the money coming from? Uh, this is gonna be Fabulous. This is in our webinar series. This is our fourth, I believe. Uh, somebody correct me if that's wrong. Uh, the recordings are all on our website. This one will also be on the website. Uh, for Q&A, put those into the Q&A section, if you would, please put your questions in the Q&A, and we will definitely get to those um, questions. And then the chat, welcome to the chat, right? Like this is a community. We want this to be a community. You all learn from each other much more than you learn from staff at NDIA. So that's a place to connect if you haven't already connected. Uh, NDIA is a national organization with an affiliate base in the community. So if you haven't joined, we welcome you to join. It's free. Uh, and um, Miles will put that link into the chat. So I'm going to turn it over to our amazing moderator, Bert, who I have to tell you, I find personally entertaining. So if any of you thought that you were going to multitask, it's not going to work very well because he has amazing panelists and he is going to keep you on your toes this whole time. All right, Bert, it's all yours. Thank you, Angela. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, we're here today to uh, 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 talk about the secrets underlying state and local government in the age of broadband. This webinar topic is to extremely timely given all the government activity and policy focus on broadband generally and digital inclusion particularly. Um, to start us off, uh, I'd like to invite each of our wonderful and talented panelists to introduce uh, herself in the context of digital equity work. Uh, in addition to your name and organization, pre please briefly tell us about your relationship to digital equity or inclusion. Let's start off with Deb Sosha. Thanks, Bert. So I am the president and CEO of the Enterprise Center in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we are an economic development arm to the city and to the county. And we unite people, organizations, and technology to build an advanced and inclusive, inclusive digital future for our community. My relationship to um, digital inclusion is that we run the Tech Goes Home Chattanooga version of the digital inclusion effort. It provides a new device, typically a Chromebook, 15 hours of training and support to get low cost internet. We, we also partner here in Chattanooga with the Ed Connect program, uh, which provides, we are in the process of providing all of our low income students to home access. 100 megabits per second symmetrical at no cost to the family for at least the next 10 years. So in addition to the digital inclusion work, we also work on smart community initiatives and we do programming for the innovation district. So we're kind of a one-stop shop. Thank you, Deb, that's awesome. Um, Lauren Amore from New York State Library, take it hey. away. 
Thanks, Bert. Um, I'm Lauren Moore. I'm the, I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Libraries in the New York State Education Department and New York State Librarian. Um, I'm here because I care about digital inclusion work. It's something I cared about in my uh, throughout my career as a librarian and trying to um, trying to use this opportunity as a state librarian to um, elevate conversations and policy around digital equity. Um, with the State Libraries CARES Act funding that we received in the spring of 2020, um, the State Library in partnership with the rest of the State Education Department um, held two digital equity summits and, and are in the process of organizing our third and final digital equity summits to establish a statewide voice um, around digital equity and to identify priorities um, for how the state um, can, all, all, all of our stakeholders across the state can work together to move the needle and get more people online in New York. Terrific, Lauren. I know there's a lot going on in New York state. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. Candelaria Mendoza, you're up next. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Candelaria Mendoza. I'm a smart city coordinator for the city of San Antonio. Uh, my relationship with the digital equity work actually started in um, my years as a, a, a library employee. Um, so I always had a passion for ensuring that people had the access and the resources and the skills that they needed to uh, thrive in a digital economy. Um, and so spent a lot of years in library. And then um, a few years ago, uh, the city of San Antonio set up a smart cities program. And so I uh, tra transitioned over there and I've been helping lead a lot of our digital inclusion and digital equity, equity work. So I consider myself a jack of all trades um having conversations building relationships uh, and i am really excited to be able to share and learn from everybody else well, welcome candelaria we look forward to hearing more about uh, uh your work uh from the municipal perspective and last but certainly not least amy huffman now our own nda policy director Thanks, Bert. It's great to be here and so fun to be with all of you talking about this topic. Um, I'm Amy Huffman. I'm the policy director for NDIA. If you're here, you know who NDIA is. Um, but prior to my tenure here, which is just under three weeks old, <laughs> um, I was the um, digital inclusion and policy manager for the broadband infrastructure office at the state of North Carolina's Department of Information Technology, which is a long way of saying that I worked for nine years in the state broadband office in North Carolina. Um, I'm still living in North Carolina, but um, during my tenure there, I did I led the research and policy and um, eventually the digital inclusion activities for the state, um, which led me to this position where I look forward to working with all of you in raising up um, your work and um, closing the national digital divide together. Excellent. Thanks, Amy. Um, let's get to it. Um, um, let's talk about uh, what the expansion uh, of interest in working on digital inclusion that COVID, that COVID brought uh, do to elevate the work and create challenges for working with other government agencies. Uh, let's hear from the city. Uh, Candelaria, you're up. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but yeah, COVID brought another layer of emphasis and momentum around a lot of the efforts and conversations um, that we locally had already been having. Luckily for us at the city of San Antonio, as part of the Smart Cities program, um, we had already kind of come to uh, an agreement that we needed to work on digital inclusion if we really wanted to um, invest and do more in smart city technologies because if we had a lot of people that were found or in the digital divide they weren't really going to be able to thrive and benefit from all of these smart uh, city technologies so um we worked uh, in collaboration with quite a few organizations we do have a digital inclusion alliance here in san antonio that definitely championed and advocated and socialized the digital divide for us so um, we were able to use a digital inclusion survey and assessment that we did right before COVID hit um, to really 
uh, propel us to um, develop a really great proposal um, that we uh, added elements of that digital inclusion survey and assessment with the true focus of equity. Um, we use an equity atlas map that the, the city's Office of Equity had developed. And we built a proposal for city to take into consideration because they wanted digital inclusion to be one of the pillars um, that supported uh, the CARES Act funds that we had received. So we received a little over um, $260 million of CARES Act dollars. And um, so we were able to submit a proposal for what we're now calling the connected beyond the classroom. So again, focusing on the student population and trying to mimic the connectivity that they would have as if they were logging on um, on their student campus, but from the convenience of their home. So the proposal builds equity. It, it uh, identified 50 neighborhoods that we needed, that we had already identified as some of the most needed areas of San Antonio that were disconnected. And so now we're working with the school districts and other local government entities to build that project um, so that we can connect up to 20,000 students from the comfort of their home. Um, so we're really excited about the fact that council approved that, that $27 million project um, and we're we're gonna be working on that for the next year or so. Um, and we're already having students connect to that network and uh, we are partnering with others to do an evaluation and setting up a help desk. So it's really, really exciting to see the support of the community and seeing others wanna kind of step in um, and provide another layer uh, to ensure that we're looking at this from the three legs of the stool, that it's not just about infrastructure, but that we're also including access to devices to the schools and then also digital literacy uh, skills in partnership with others. That's, that's terrific, very impressive Candelaria. Um, <clears throat> Lauren is a fellow state employee. I'm interested to hear uh, as I'm sure the audience is on the challenges uh, uh, working within the state government at this point, particularly with respect to broadband. Yeah, I mean, it's challenging even to talk about this sort of thing, right? I'm sure <laughs> we all speak very slowly and, and measure our words because um, these relationships are complex and dynamic and um, delicate, but that's part of, I think, one of the reasons why I love working in this position because, you know, being able to navigate these complex systems to ultimately help people is what we're all, we're all here to do. Um, I think one of the things that happened in this past year that was... I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we all saw this. Everyone who is part of the NDIA community probably had their jaw drop many times when they heard people who maybe two years ago, they were trying to convince that digital divides existed and that digital inequities persist and that digital equities are deep and tied to systemic inequities. And there we're gonna need huge resources to solve this problem. You know, those conversations, I feel like all of a sudden, after once the pandemic happened, the entire conversation shifted and these people that we were trying to convince about these problems beforehand, suddenly were using the words that we had been using all along, right, as advocates for digital equity. Um, and what a tremendous opportunity to finally have people in power, people in decision making roles, people with funding behind them, um, starting from that same place of acknowledging um, that digital inequity is a problem. And so that we could move beyond what I, I love this phrase that my, my colleague Mary Beth Casey used in a meeting and I use it all the time now, which is that we used to spend a lot of time admiring the problem. Um, and that now I finally think we're at the point where we can stop admiring this, this problem and start thinking about what it means to solve the problem. Um, but that being said, you still can't, there's a lot of other stuff in between before you get to these solutions. And I think one of the things that I have learned, and this is one of the things that's interesting about working in, and I'm sure it's not just at state government, it's probably at local government and county government levels as well. Everyone has their own piece of power, their own bit of power. Um, and you have to kind of recognize where is your voice most uh, most powerful? Where do you actually have the authority to say what you want to say and do the work that you need to do? Like kind of figuring these things out. And for me in this position at this moment, 
um, I think the, the reason why the summits were really important was it was an opportunity for me to say here in the state education department with my colleagues to say this isn't a problem that schools can solve on their own, that libraries can solve on their own, that the executive government can solve on their own. This is going to involve every single person in the state working together. So it became powerful, I think, for the department to be not the person leading the solutions, but instead the person bringing people to the organization bringing people together. Um, so that ended up being really meaningful. And from there, we were able to kind of sketch out where, where, do, where, do our, where our voice is still needed. And I think one of the places where our voice will continue to be needed as advocates and as people who um, are trying to advance policy that helps people in the end is this idea that we, everyone acknowledges it's not just about access, it's access and affordability, but there's also this human element at the end of these connections. And that is a piece that we're finding is a place that the state education department can have a very um, important role in, in advocating for. How do we um, support community-based organizations and schools and libraries and other people on the ground that do that high touch, high intensity, high resource needed part of actually getting people online. Yeah, uh, uh, it's a terrific uh, uh, explanation of, of exactly what uh, what is going on, particularly in state government. You hit it right on the head when you said it's almost like the light switch went off once people couldn't go to work, they couldn't go to school, they couldn't go see their doctor, then suddenly the policymakers realized broadband matters. So, um, but thanks, that's great, Warren. Um, so let's get on to the next uh, question. Uh, in, in your experiences, how do you get people to the table and move to action during this uh, age of, of, uh, of COVID and broadband uh, of, I'll say, awareness. Deb? Thanks, Bert. That was really interesting, Lauren. I really appreciated your comment about the people at the end, right? The people at the other end of the wire. Um, so I have really good news and, and not so good news, but the, the time to prepare for an audacious product project, like getting everyone connected is before you need to, because a big part of this is the creation of a collaboration. And so in our case, thankfully in Chattanooga, we did have that allowed us to, to move real quickly, but you gotta have everybody at the table. And when I say everybody, I mean the elected officials, Lauren's exactly right having convening power really matters. Um, having the support of the libraries, the schools, the local community organizations, the faith-based organizations. Because we run Tech Goes Home here, we've already built some relationships. We have over a hundred partners that run Tech Goes Home in our community that allowed us to get some trust pretty quick in this process and to get people on board. And we also thought, um, you know, both short-term and long-term, um, Ken, Candelaria, I am so impressed by the number of dollars that were committed to your project. We were able to get 8.2, which for a small city is very helpful. And that $8.2 million will allow us uh, with some ongoing uh, costs over the next 10 years to connect every student who is low income in this community and their families to 100 megabit symmetrical. It's interesting to me because at this point in time, I think back to when Mignon Clyburn was a commissioner, because she, she used to say all the time, you will not get people on board until this becomes an economic development issue. And here we are, it's an economic development issue and we've got folks on board. So um, we also had a short-term solution that we put in place. We've put up Wi-Fi hotspots. We've had about 100,000 people connecting to that or 100,000 hits, uh, 50 terabits of data. Um, and in our HCS Ed Connect, we'll be connecting 28,000 children, 17,000 homes, and making sure that those folks stay connected for the next uh, 10 years. And so the economic development impact of that is that folks can work from home. In Chattanooga, one of our large employers has said they will not hire anybody who doesn't have a certain level of home access into even an entry-level job. 
because they want to know that you can work from home. So here we are, we need to figure this out. Um, so I think the, the ability to convene is really helpful from the elected officials, but it's also helpful to have built those relationships in advance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, that reminds me, Deb, that uh, in Connecticut, what we found is that uh, working remotely in, in government, at least, uh, uh, has gone very well. Um, and in fact, the governor is now talking about getting rid of some of the uh, buildings that the state owns because uh, the realization is that uh, you don't need to have people in the office necessarily to get the, uh, to get the work done. Uh, but in any event, uh, I do want to go back, Warren, to you. Uh, Deb did uh, uh, mention you, but uh, how do you uh, see getting people to the table and getting action going? So I, it's actually, it's interesting being part of the state education department. I mean, this is a regulatory agency that people care about because it affects their lives and their children's lives. And people want to have a seat at the table and they, if they feel like their voices are going to be respected and listened to and honored. Um, so I think getting people to the table is not the hard part. Um, but honoring, respecting, and doing the right thing with that with those people's efforts and times, that is the real challenge and the thing that I think we have yet to deliver on. That's the long road ahead and something that hoping to hoping to do a good job with that. Um, and I think just doing all that we can to decenter ourselves and share the mic, share the power, share the resources, um, ultimately that will be our goal moving forward. It's um it's 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 a it's I was not going to say it's a shift because I don't think it's a shift. It's just a different kind of work and a different kind of moment and a different kind of energy. Um, and uh, yeah, I would, I'm just trying to look to all the, the organizers and all the, or, all the organizations and all the people that have been doing this work all along and trying to learn from them and grow from them and work alongside them and, and using that capacity to the best of our abilities. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Candelaria, can I come back to you, please? Uh, 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 what role do you play in fostering trust and building relationships uh, with trusted uh, community-based organizations? I know uh, CBOs are very important to the digital inclusion world. Yeah, no, I, we definitely, I see my role as a, as a convener. Um, and to Lauren's point, I really do feel like you have to take that role very seriously. And um, we're actually just working on a um, roadmap to try to kind of prepare us for any potential funding opportunities that are being explored th through additional funding. Um, and we're having these really great conversations about being burned out with surveys and talking about the same thing of like, yes, we're all struggling and we all have challenges. Community engagement is really difficult to do in a space of a pandemic. Um, so how do you reach those people that are um, the most disconnected um, at a time like this? So it's um, the very powerful stories that we're trying to capture and build into um, what we're trying to do. Um, and again, I think uh, that trust is established by listening um, and really intending to follow through uh, with either collaboration or finding opportunities um, to work together to go out for some funding. And again, at the core of it, ensure that the community members uh, are gonna be the beneficiaries of those conversations, of those programs. So we definitely take that role very seriously during um, when COVID kind of first hit, we actually created a digital inclusion task force. Again, just because we understood capacity for agencies that were struggling, um, the city wanted to take that role on of like, okay, we want to listen. Like, how how is this impacting everybody? You know, it was everything from workforce development of how do you go and tell somebody to fill out their unemployment application if every library is closed, if every community center lab is closed. Um, so now you have people that are were already disconnected that um, don't have options. So it was really about working together and finding those short-term solutions of like doing Wi-Fi in the parking lots, of working on promotional campaigns, um, 
using some via buses that weren't being used because of the pandemic and putting them into parking lots to provide free Wi-Fi to um, uh, San Antonio Housing Authority families. So it was really, um, it was great for all of us to kind of build that place of collaboration and work together to leverage um, and find some short-term solutions for the for our community that was that was really struggling um, with finding access when everything just shut down. Um, understood totally, um, Deb. I know that uh, your organization works a lot with organizations in the community. Um, perhaps you could also weigh in on the fostering trust and building those relationships issue. Uh, I will always believe that trust is the most important lever when you're trying to make change. It just really matters. And so, you know, we had some existing relationships, which I mentioned, and it allowed us to work in a much broader way across the city. But we didn't just um, receive help from them, we also helped them, right? So every relationship should be a give and take. And what we discovered when the pandemic hit was a lot of these local organizations could not continue their work because they didn't have what they needed. It wasn't just people who live in our community, but people who work in our community. And for us, one of the challenges is we didn't just have a pandemic. We also had a tornado tear through town last year in April. So it's been about a year. Um, and so we really had to find ways to work together. There were 400 homes that were impacted. Some of them will never come back. So it was pretty serious time. And so finding ways to leverage what we know, and certainly Damon mentioned in the chat, uh, using the United Way as a lever for that as well, uh, finding ways to help people continue to do their, their services. We gave out computers and tablets and hotspots to a, a large number of, of our resource partners. Faith-based organizations taught them how to be able to, uh, to give services, but also how to collect donations because they're a small business and they employ. So thinking about the breadth of who we could support, it was important to us. We really wanted to make sure folks could continue to participate in telehealth and, and telemental health and all of those resources. And because they are the folks that are closest to the people in the community, they could use that level of trust to get them support and also provide them with information about not just the work that we were doing to connect them in their homes, but also about what was going on with COVID and where the resources were for that. So I, I think those relationships are paramount. Thank you so much and so true. Um, <clears throat> uh, Amy, uh, I want to get you into the uh, into the mix here. Um, may I cross-examine you? <laughs> Since I'm in our hearing room, I have some of you may have noticed the lights go in and out. Um, but in any event, uh, listen, you just started working at NDIA, but you've been in the field for years, uh, including working on uh, uh, broadband inclusion is issues for move-in state government in North Carolina. You're nationally known. Um, and uh, first, what advice would you give to state and local governments seeking to build a digital inclusion program or ecosystem? Nationally known, that's uh, some big shoes to live into. <laughs> um, uh, first, I think I wanna go back to Lauren's point about how we can't solve this on our own. You know, it actually takes quite a bit of hubris to think that any one of us can solve this issue by ourselves, right? Um, this, what I like to talk about with the digital divide is that, is that it's so wide, it's so vast, and it penetrates every aspect of our society and every industry, every vertical, that each of us have to like do our part, right? And have to work together to, to, to close this thing. Um, that said, state and local governments, we can't close the digital divide without them, right? And they have to be um, playing major roles in this um, and even more than they have in the past. And so we have to equip them with what they need to do that um, and pull them into, the, into, the, um, into this work. So for states and um, specifically, many of you might know there are several, um, most states, not every state, but most states now have a broadband office. So I'll specifically kind of be speaking about them since that's the world I know. Um, but with states, I think the first thing, actually, this is the first advice I give everyone, join the NDIA community, like sign up, right? Join listeners, come to these events, 
learn from this community because it's a really wonderful community and you will learn a lot. Um, the second kind of going with that is find your friends. So who in your state, um, so if you're in uh, Washington or Tennessee or Texas, who in your state is doing digital inclusion work? There are folks on the ground doing it. I can guarantee you NDIA has affiliates in 44 states. Someone on our team can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there are folks on the ground that are doing this work already and they are experts and they are um, leaders in their communities and they are trusted resources and you have a lot to learn from them and talking to them. And it, once you know who they are and what they're doing, um, you can figure out how to work together, how to build this ecosystem that complements each other's work, right? Because that's what we ultimately want. We want an ecosystem where digital inclusion and digital equity becomes a reality. And that only happens if everyone's working together. Um, and yes, Deb's right. They are willing to share resources and work together. And often sometimes what I found in North Carolina is, is actually some of these groups don't even know each other. So you as the state have that convening power to pull these groups together and then they can learn from each other. It becomes this complementary ecosystem. Um, states should also begin to think about, and we have a white paper on our website um, about this, but begin to think about starting, if you don't have already a um, digital equity office, or at least a <laughs> digital equity or digitally in, digital inclusion focused person within your state broadband office, right? Um, of course, that uh, takes time in state government. I fully recognize that um, there's a lot of red tape, um, but you can look to both Washington state and North Carolina where job postings are available right now and look at those and see and talk to folks there about how they did that. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of having someone thinking about this day to day, right? Someone to, to play that convening and coordinating role. And in our white paper, which we can talk more about later, there's some specific roles and things that we think state broadband offices and, and folks can do. Um, I would also encourage uh, states with existing broadband programs to think about ways that you can integrate digital inclusion into your existing work. So if you have a grant program, design it so that it also reach, uh, works towards uh, making broadband more affordable in your communities, right? So it also, it's simultaneously doing both things. So survey what you're already doing, figure out how you can um, incorporate digital inclusion into that existing work. Um, and finally, and I'm still speaking to states here, <laughs> sorry, this is a long-winded answer. You gave me the mic, so I'm using it. Um, <laughs> uh, for state policymakers, when you're addressing broadband availability in your state, you also need to be addressing digital inclusion and affordability. Um, the take rate is not going to take care of itself, right? Um, if you just increase broadband availability across your state without simultaneously ad addressing digital inclusion and affordability, you're not going to get the effects that you want, right? We're not going to see the promises that broadband makes to our communities. People have to adopt it and subscribe to it to see the benefits, right? So policymakers do both. You can do both at the same time, I promise. Um, Local governments, I think a lot of my advice is the same, you know, talk to the folks on the ground who are doing the work in your communities. Again, there are folks doing it. Um, pull them together in a coalition or a task force, make a digital inclusion plan or, or pull together some, you know, a template of, or just a couple ideas of how you might come together um, to spend this federal funding. Right now is a really great time to do that, right? Figure out how to do that together. Um, and finally, um, we have this great thing called a Trailblazers program at NDIA. You should, um, you should, uh, well, first of all, what it is, is Trailblazers is a Google Fiber sponsored honor roll recognition of local governments and their initiatives. And the great thing about this project is that the Trailblazers webpage um, serves as a cache for all documentation used by local governments to develop their own digital inclusion programs. It's freely available on our site. And we're also accepting applications until April 30th, which is this Friday, y'all. So get those applications in. We'd love to see more cities be um, trailblazers. Hey, and then, hey, yeah. Amy, I'm sorry, Amy, can I just, I lost my light, but can I, uh, <laughs> can I just, uh, can I just uh, ask you, like, let's look at it from the other side. If you're on the outside and you now want to influence uh, uh, government, uh, policy makers, state broadband offices, whomever. What advice can you give uh, 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 practitioners in, in this area, how to approach uh, government workers? Yes. We Definitely. want to be approached, but how, how would you recommend that? 
Yeah, and I think for in approaching states, just to first remember that, um, first of all, not every state has a state broadband office, but if you would like to find out, um, we're going to paste a link in the chat um, to NTIA's uh, Broadband USA page where you can find out who the broadband person is in your state, right? So that's a great resource for you. So start there. Um, but first know that every state's broadband office is different. Um, every state government's different, but every state broadband office has different capacity, different number of people working on this issue. Um, so just know that before you talk with them. Um, but I would just say, you know, reach out to them, let them know you're there, let them know what you do, let's figure out how you can support them in their work. And then they can also, and then also maybe have an ask for them how they can support you, right? Um, I know most of these folks, they want to do digital inclusion work, they're under-resourced and understaffed, right? So figure out a way how your work can complement each other. Um, and really, you know, to both local governments and states, just pull your seat up to the table. Um, this is the time to butt in <laughs> and make known that you are an expert. You've been doing this work for years. Um, your work is uh, closing the digital divide. And again, we all need to do this together. So if they don't know about you, they can't work with you and they can't support you. So um, contact your county managers, your city managers. They can then direct you to the right folks. Maybe do a little research on the site, see if see if your local libraries are already doing some work. They're a great place to start often. Um, but yeah, reach out. And, and you know, taking uh, taking uh, what you're saying, just keep in mind, audience, that. Uh, people work for the government. Uh, we work for you. Um, and uh, uh, generally, when you reach out to us with suggestions, ideas, uh, that helps us do our jobs better. Uh, I think that's probably your experience as well, Amy, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, I learned almost entirely everything I knew from the NDIA community and the folks on the ground doing the work, right? Uh, in the digital inclusion world. And, th and then their work informed what we advocated for and then the tools we built. So it's absolutely, a, a, it can become a very virtuous cycle um, when, when there's that collaboration. I wanna add to, I wanna build on Amy's answer. I love the point about starting, actually starting on a local level. You can approach the top too, but I think people really miss an opportunity to start, starting at like the, if you are a school librarian, start with your principal. If you are a library director, start with your city mayor or your town supervisor. Um, that ends up being the way that you build momentum, you get the right people on board. And that's what I'm seeing in New York as the places where the biggest change is happening. And of course, there's a state role in, in all of this, but the larger the groundswell, the larger the movement at a local level, the the larger the networks of support at the most local levels are, the more effective you are going to be at implementing changes. Absolutely. Thank you both. Um, this has been terrific. Um, we are uh, almost near the, the end of the, our, our presentations. I have a few more questions, but uh, I want to encourage everybody who is uh, uh, watching us uh, to send your questions into the uh, into the Q and A uh, uh, tab, uh, because this is your chance to uh, to uh, as they say, try our minds, get our secrets. Uh, uh, we may not give them out unless you ask us, so uh, we encourage you to do so. So anyway, we we always uh, call something like this the bonus round. This is uh, this is probably final jeopardy. Uh, uh, for lack of a better term. So here's, uh, this is for all four panelists. Um, there's a lot of money coming in now uh, at the federal level for uh, broadband. Um, and there's a lot more money uh, that's being proposed uh, for the upcoming infrastructure bills. So all this is intended to improve uh, internet access um, through state and local government uh, funding and action. Um, so can you just give us a, a very brief uh, uh, thought on how you are uh, either from your agency or from your perspective are preparing for this influx of money um, and uh, how best to spend it? 
Um, Candelaria, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so yeah, we're definitely having uh, or continue to have conversations around opportunities that might come up in the future um, when funding uh, is involved. Uh, one of the things that we decided to move forward with, which is always kind of on the queue um, with our work, is to build a digital equity plan um, that we're now kind of we're now calling a roadmap. Um, and so um, to the point of kind of just being shovel ready uh, and looking at what is already happening in San Antonio, how we could potentially enhance that across organizations, and then obviously building um, to the point that was made earlier, right? Um, not one organization or one entity is gonna be able to do this all. Um, so it's really about establishing those relationships and that trust so that we can apply for funding, uh, apply for grants, or when it does come down uh, the channels that we actually have a game plan of where that money could be the most effective um, and have the biggest impact. Um, so we're, we're definitely working. Um, we actually are enga we engaged Boston Consulting Group and a local community engagement firm to help us. Um, again, we wanted to make sure that we we're going to be able to reach our community and add capacity to not only the city, but other entities and ensure that somebody is helping us kind of bring the big picture together um, and really build some strong, solid strategies that we could come together on and submit for, for funding. So that's, that's kind of our initial uh, game plan for the moment. Uh, great. That, that's, ter that's terrific. Uh, so uh, one of the takeaways there was uh, uh, consultants. Um, uh, before, Deb, you're next, but before I do that, I just want to say there's not enough questions in the Q&A. I want some questions now, okay? I'm trying to be like Angela, and you don't say no to Angela. So anyway, Deb, you're up, spending money. What, what are you doing to prepare? Uh, well, for us, a big part of this is looking at what's coming out and really evaluating what it can pay for and what it can't and who can use it. One of the challenges in Tennessee, which is why I mentioned the state preemptions, is that our local utility cannot build broadband beyond its electric boundary. In providing free or free to them support for our students, we have a small area in our county that is not covered by our local utility. So everybody else gets 100 megabits symmetrical and they get a Wi-Fi, a 4G hotspot, unlimited. I would love it if we could use that money to take care of those folks. That's the kind of thing that really shouldn't be a barrier, right? We really care about helping our neighbors. So part of what we're also looking at is we, we participate in a regional broadband council. How can those dollars be used by surrounding areas and their cooperatives, because Tennessee now allows co-ops to build? How do we use, the, you know, use our information, our knowledge to help those communities build what we have here in Chattanooga so we can have a regional impact? Um, I also think this is, again, that, that time, moment in time where you bring people together, right? You get your faith-based folks and your libraries and schools and healthcare and nonprofits because absolutely, Amy, it's everybody, right? And it's deep and it's wide, as you suggest. And the only way we solve this is when everybody's sitting around a table and looking at the options. And I, one other thing I would say about this is really think big, right? Don't, don't imagine a short-term stopgap solution. Figure out what will it take to get this completely resolved for the people in your community, and then try and see if you can't find a way to fund making that happen. I think that sometimes we, especially with uh, technology, are building for things we needed yesterday instead of for things we're gonna need 20 years from now. And fiber has a long lifetime. So finding ways to figure out how to make it future-proof for me is really a huge issue as well. Thanks, uh, thanks Deb. Removing barriers and thinking big, very important. Amy, uh, any thoughts? Um, um, I know you were at NDIA and you're not thinking about spending money now, but what advice can you give based on all your experience? in uh, state uh, broadband offices? 
Well, I, from NDIA's perspective, we are, you know, we're trying to make sure that the funding coming down is available for both um, digital inclusion and, you know, um, uh, availability, right? Um, right now, that's not a given. So we're trying to, to make sure that happens. And by digital inclusion, you know, specifically looking at affordability, right? So the emergency broadband benefit program, looking at trying to make sure that's a permanent broadband benefit program and that there's enough willpower and um, resources behind making, um, understanding that yes, we can um, decrease costs for everyone, right? Making the market better, but also there's always gonna be folks that need a, a, a permanent broadband subsidy. And so making sure there's funds for that. So we're advocating for that, looking at how to build that, that sort of thing. Um, while simultaneously looking at the other funds and, and trying to make sure that those get to you all, right? To, to folks on the ground um, who need these funds to build digital navigator programs, who need these funds to do things like make sure there's digital literacy available for everyone, make sure everyone has computers. So we're trying to make sure that those things happen. Um, and then from the state level, just make sure you're staying up to date, right? And what's going on and what the funds can be used for and, and think creatively when these funds come out, think creatively, how can we uh, creatively apply these uh, funds to close the digital divide in our state um, while simultaneously addressing both uh, availability and the adoption of broadband, which then you know looks at all those three legs of the stool. Thanks, good advice. Warren, you get the last word here. Well, we're working on a, a, a kind of a plan for collaborative action um, that, uh, as a result of this summit, the, the digital equity summits that we hosted. And we hope that the Board of Regents will actually be adopting them in, in June. And that hopefully will be a tool to guide department spending, and but also a tool for, for the rest of our stakeholders across the state um, in terms of what, what, what kinds of things are important to people. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any huge surprises. There's, there are items like making sure that the right kind of da data is available to everyone to develop their own plans and develop their own cases for funding. Um, it's about making sure that we invest in some sort of programs Digital navigator is the phrase that people keep using, programs that will help people make use of these emergency benefits that are coming down the, down, down the way to, to, towards us. Um, so it's exciting, it's exciting to put a plan in place, exciting to think about these things. But I agree with everyone else that there's also, for me, this really important, this thing I keep thinking about, which is how do we make sure that these emergency measures aren't just a flash in the pan, but that end up resulting in long-term sustainability, long-term capacity building, long-term changes that withstand this, this one moment. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a different kind of work. Um, I think part of that, and this is something that's really important to me as a state librarian, is to making sure that whatever funding is available, that a, a significant percentage of that goes to shore up the infrastructure, the public infrastructure that already exists. So that's shoring up libraries, it's shoring up the other governmental entities and other, other, other tools and systems that exist already, making them strong, giving them a strong foundation so that they can get this work deep into communities. Um, in the end, we wanna make sure that these services, these, this money isn't just benefiting the same people it always benefits, that instead we actually make, make meaningful change. We know that digital inequities are tied to racial inequities and racial injustice. We know that there are other systemic kinds of things like disability and language that are affecting affecting ways of people's of people's ability to get online. So we really need to be intentional, um, and and that's going to require quick work now, but also a willingness to do things slowly and carefully and using the systems that exist. Um, terrific. Um, I've learned so much today as I do with every uh, NDIA event. Uh, Angela, looks like we're ready to respond to questions and comments from the audience if you wanna take it away. Absolutely, thanks Bert. We have a lot of questions. This is very exciting. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the very first one. It has to do with cooperative extension service. Uh, have any of our panelists, since I can also you verbally if anybody wants to do a little wave, worked with cooperative extension services? 
That's a big no. Okay. As a, as a regional library system director, when we we created a regional digital inclusion coalition, the Cornell Cooperative Extensions that served the the, the counties that were part of this coalition were great participants and had great ideas and great access to resources. Like they had access to money that no one else even knew about. So they're great partners and they have a really big wide perspective. So that's a great, great example of a partner in, in work. That's perfect, thank you. And we know the state of, the, in, in the state of Washington, their extension service has been really involved in digital equity work. So um, one of my staff, Sabrina, will be sure to throw a link in about the work that occurred there. Um, so tips on reaching out to and working with local government, particularly when there's a lack of trust with the local government. Okay, Deb. Yep. So, you know, that, that is, there is a lack of trust, not just in government, but in a lot of local agencies and entities. And so what we have always done is really leveraged, leveraged the trust that other entities have. So for example, they, the folks in this particular community may not know me, may not trust me, but they do trust that faith-based leader or that librarian or that school teacher. And so I work with them to be the, the conduit of information and opportunity. I don't think we can imagine that we would build that kind of trust without those kinds of relationships that people in the community actually already have. Perfect, thank you. I'm gonna to go to a question from Alyssa Kenny. Uh, this is a question that NDIA gets often. So how do you go about finding practitioners, right? So uh, we all know that in the big scheme of things that what we all call digital inclusion is really fairly new. And there are organizations as mentioned earlier, right? We know there are organizations on the ground doing digital inclusion work. They don't necessarily call themselves digital inclusion programs. They don't call themselves digital equity programs. How do you find them? Amy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Well, first, you can go to our website. We have a map with a list of all of our affiliates, which we have. Oh, Angela, how many do we have now? Over 500. Over 500. Over 500 affiliates. Um, and so you can go there and sort, look through the map and figure out who's in your community. Um, second, once you find at least one in your community, guarantee they know five more. Right. So ask them who else is doing this work that I should be talking to. Um, it's kind of um, like a snowball research effect. Right. So that's where I would start. And if you find no one on the map, um, you can reach out to us or reach out to your state broadband offices. They may know someone on the ground. Um, that's where I would start. Perfect. And if I can if I can add to that, Amy, that's yeah. exactly true. We actually started a local broadband coalition and every meeting there'd be more people because they invite somebody who knows somebody who's doing something else. That's awesome. I would say also one thing that we I learned from the Digital Equity Summit, and I don't, I don't know, I just made it really clear in a way that wasn't clear to me beforehand, but there are a lot of organizations doing this work that don't even understand that they're doing digital inclusion work. It's not a label they put on themselves. So it seems really important to start with community members, start with communities that you know do not have internet access, talk to them. Where do they go for help? Where do they go? Where do they turn for support? Where, where are their trusted sources? Um, and that's probably also a great place to start and invest in, um, in terms of building relationships and building capacity. That's perfect. So th this is the asset mapping that we're always talking about, needing to know who already is doing that digital inclusion work. And it, it is a job, right? It is something one has to do. Okay, I'm gonna move to a question from Peyton. Um, he's asking, so, so the, they are asking that the digital literacy programming, we know digital literacy programming affects broadband adoption. So Peyton wants to know, how do you know digital literacy program affects broadband adoption? And, and what would you use to convince somebody? I'd be happy to mention. So um, we actually have done at Tech Goes Home, both here in Chattanooga and Boston, pre-surveys, post-surveys, and really looked a year later. So we, we know that the percentage of people without broadband access is this. Uh, sometimes it's 30% or 40%, depending on the community we're working with. Um, and then afterward, checking to see where they are, and we see 95%, 96% have home access. So we have a sense of that. It's not perfect. Um, we are in Chattanooga doing a really deep survey with Boston College EdTech researchers right now. 
uh, hoping that not only will it help us, but will help everybody else to have information that is vetted by a well-known researcher. But I, I think it's pretty clear for those of us who've been providing that digital literacy programming that it has an impact, even if it's only available locally, the information. If I may add, Angela, I know that ARP is very big on this issue. And uh, um, I, I think uh, in response, they have uh, recognized that this is a, and my light went off again. <laughs> They recognize that this is uh, something that needs to be developed. So I'll move, I'll turn the light back on and uh, you go on to the next question. <laughs> I, I think we need to come up with some kind of story about how there are ghosts over in Connecticut and what they're doing to Pert's office. But we can leave that storytelling for later. Uh, James Neal from IMLS has a great question for Lauren. So Lauren, uh, James, NDIA, lots of folks are impressed with the uh, digital equity summit model that you developed in New York. Uh, how can that be replicated? What's your advice to a state thinking about doing it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think a state, another state library, li library can do this for sure. We're happy to help provide any tools that we develop, but I'll say we, we leaned really heavily on NDIA and the NDIA com community. We use tools that already existed and, and modify them to work for, for our state. So yeah, we'll just continue to, to push it forward, to share and to allow people to build and develop uh, the tools in a way that works for, for them. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to provide any assistance to any other state library that's interested in doing that work. Perfect. Thank you, Lauren. So an anonymous question, but it's a really good one because we I feel like we've hit upon this quite a bit. The, the issue of a state broadband office being focused solely on availability and, and wanting to convince them that they can, that that's very limiting and, and to address that digital equity uh, aspect of it. Who can take that one? How do you convince them, Amy? Yeah. Um... I think again, you know, most of the state broadband offices would love to be doing digital inclusion work. I, I just want to say that um, they just maybe don't have the resources, the staff. Many, many of these broadband offices are one-person shops, right? Um, they also are given. Um, many of them are given legislative authority to only do certain things, right? So they've maybe been given a grant program. Um, so one thing to convince them to do it is to help them build buy-in, right, with their state houses and their governors um, to get them funding so that they can do that work. That's really important. They need people. They need funding. Um, but before, before you assume that they don't want to, maybe have a conversation with them. Um, and if you still find that they don't want to, I think it, the, the research is there. Um, it's very, it's all, it's all over the place on our website. Someone can drop a link in the chat to all of the research we have and have a database, but the research is there that shows that, um, broadband access, the sheer availability of pipes and wires doesn't increase the economic uh, opportunity or viability for communities. It's the adoption of it. Um, and so to put in some strategies that make sure that happen. Um, and then also we're welcome, or we are happy to help. We're, we're gonna be building up our state broadband initiative work and um, we're happy to help um, any state stand up that sort of program. I think the challenge uh, from a state broadband office perspective is that we are statewide and digital inclusion work is on the ground. But nevertheless, I think it's very important that the state broadband office be involved overall in, uh, uh, if not coordinating, certainly supplementing and uh, uh, provide being a resource uh, for uh, local on the ground digital inclusion efforts. It's, it's imperative. And uh, yeah, it is a struggle. I'm, I'm an officer one and uh, we're hoping to get uh, uh, some more uh, uh, staff added in next year or so, but uh, we definitely want to do it and we want to do it all. So, one of the uh, arguments that we've seen, seen to a good, have good response back from is the low take rate um, of when, when, but it's not just about having the availability of broadband because we have that in urban areas now, right? So, we know that if you build it, they don't necessarily come. Um, and because it is more complex, the barriers are more complex than just having it be available. And so being able to point like, is that a good use of, of state and federal resources 
to build something that only our, uh, our most educated and our most uh, wealthy are able to make use of. So the equity piece of it can sometimes be described in terms of what's a good use of, of uh, public funds. Pat Millen is asking us to talk about devices. Who wants to talk about devices? I already mentioned our circumstance. I know, Pat, the work that you're doing is amazing. I am always impressed. Every time I look in LinkedIn, you've done something else new. That's fabulous. Um, at, in Chattanooga, we give a free Chromebook. And the reason we do that is we don't have a van. We don't have storage. We don't have people to repair them. We don't have capacity to make that happen. And for us, a brand new Chromebook ends up not costing much more than if I had gotten a refurbished and had to put in a hard drive and wipe anything if it came into me with, with the hard drive. So for us, we use those. But again, the biggest issue, I think, is um, where do you get the money to do it, right? How do you fund these? So one of the ways that we fund it, and I saw some alluding to this in the chat, is we think about who benefits when people are connected. Banks benefit. Healthcare organizations benefit, government benefits, right? We're increasing civic participation. All of those things are things I look at when we're looking for how are we gonna fund this? And so we, we do give a brand new one with a warranty with a local person who will do support. Let me supplement, Deb. Um, it's also worth checking with, uh, charitable foundations, um, because right now everyone realizes that uh, uh, broadband uh, access to the internet is essential and uh, you can have a, a, a wireline connection to your, uh, uh, to your household, but if you don't have the devices, it doesn't do much good. And uh, uh, there's so much to sell that with, with telehealth, remote learning, working from home, applying for uh, social service benefits, including unemployment, it's essential. Yeah, and I'll add that um, states can support their local device refurbishers if you have one in the state. So uh, Pat is a dear friend. He is uh, runs E2D, which is a wonderful nonprofit in North Carolina that um, high school students actually are the ones that are paid double the minimum wage to refurbish used devices from companies in Charlotte. Um, and we have another refurbisher in North Carolina called Cramden Institute. And both of them do great work where they take, you know, something that was uh, not being used from a corporation, um, turning it into a usable device for low income households and students across the state. Um, so states can support that work by making sure that state devices get in their hands, right? Which doesn't always happen. Um, the federal government can do that as well and local governments can do that as well. So that's just another way to um, get at that device issue. Okay, we're gonna wrap up with one big question, which is why it's the wrap up. And I think this question is spot on. The pandemic has had lots of folks like, ah, we have to solve the digital divide. Um, and so there's a lot of band-aids, right? Um, hot spots, quick, <laughs> right? Drive by, throw them out the window, like quick, quick. We need to give people access. Uh, put Wi-Fi in a parking lot uh, in an urban area. Oh, it makes my head hurt to think about that. Um, but like really folks were well-meaning, wanting to get answers out really quick. How does one balance that, which is total legit concerns with wanting to create solutions that are more stable, more, um, more integrating of the community itself? How do you, and as you all have worked on this, how do you think about that issue and how do you try to balance it? Who's first? Deb, Deb I can go first. Question. I can go first because I already spoke about this a little bit, right? The initial thing we did was said we have an emergency to resolve. And that emergency is a short term, you know, a short term intervention because we know the big intervention is going to take a while, right? Our short term intervention was to determine what parts of our city had the highest number of people not using internet, the highest number of students. Uh, the lowest income, sort of where are those places where people live 
that haven't had the opportunity to purchase home internet or for whom it's too expensive. Affordability for me is always where it's at. And so we did stand up 110 Wi-Fi hotspots, which in Chattanooga is not as hard as if you were in Boston, right? Because, you know, December here is not the same as December there, but we're still seeing huge uptake right now in that. The other side of this for us was, what is that long-term solution? How are we getting, in this case, we worked on the students. We're thinking about what our next group will be next, but how do we get people connected long-term to affordable opportunities? Uh, we do have another challenge in Tennessee that uh, we are actually, our local utility can't sell broadband for less than it costs them to provision it. So that's another challenge we dealt with and we dealt with it by a lot of creative in interventions, including purchasing equipment and, um, and also having a reduction in the cost of managing the bills because we have one bill for every, everybody. But I think if you're not thinking long-term, you know, I've watched this happen. A lot of people are, are again and again and again every month having to, to put money in. Um, without a return on that, that becomes a challenge. I, I love that we were able to put money in and it actually remains a, a problem solved. So finding those opportunities for me was really important. Uh, so we're getting there. We've connected um, about 14,000 children so far. Andrew, may I just, may I just uh, supplement what Deb said and, and it basically uh, proves the point. In dealing with uh, uh, addressing the remote learning issue, um, it became clear to people who were starting to think about policy from the upper levels of government here, that they realized that that was just the urgent, uh, uh, the urgency that had to be addressed. Uh, I think Joe Mancini is that his name put in the chat. A crisis is a bad, terrible thing to waste. And then you developing, uh, it became more aware that there were policy issues, longer term policy issues that had to be addressed. Um, and certainly they continue to need to be addressed. And that's why my message to everybody would be uh, to talk with your uh, uh, elected officials. Uh, at, the, at the local and state level uh, and let them know what your thoughts are about uh, addressing the issue. Um, and that will uh, build up the momentum so that uh, uh, longer term solutions could be enacted, whether by uh, policy or by legislation. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Bert. Okay, we're going to give last word to Lauren Moore. Let's hear it, Lauren. It's going to okay. be really good. So this is just a, a gut instinct. It's anecdotal. I hope I am wrong about this, but I also think we're giving the Band-Aid solution a little too much credit. I know in New York, everyone, the, everyone was so effective at getting students connected, but I don't know that we made any kind of huge investment in adults without children in their homes. I hope those programs exist, but I didn't see them. So I think that that's, there's just still so much, so much work to do. And we have to just keep talking about why this is important. We, and, and I think like that's why everything that Deb and Bert were just saying is so important. We have to just keep building on it and keep moving into the long-term because these band-aids were just like this much to, to get through a crisis, but we need to make sure that we change, we change this permanently to help, help create equity in the long term. That's perfect ending to this. Uh, I have, um, I told a colleague recently that we were never going to close a digital divide and she said it made, a wonder, wonder, made her want to cry. And I only say that to mean the technology is going to keep changing. We can close current divides, but then we just need to be prepared that there's going to be more divides coming up and that we think about it as systems change, not just as individual pieces that need addressed. Uh, so we, there were lots of questions we did not get to. Thank you all for joining us here. The uh, NDIA, we have lots of other resources on our website. We have our Friday community calls. We have an active listserv. So if, there, if you have more questions, join the community uh, and reach out to NDIA staff and we will find answers to your questions. Uh, so thank you everyone and have a great Wednesday. <laughs>